Good afternoon. My name is Julie Adams, and I'm a regional consultant for the Kentucky Center for Mathematics. Today, our focus is focus on place value um, to 10 and landscape of learning. My name is Julie Adams, of course. I'm going to be your host for today. Um, below is my contact information with my email. I wanted to start out with a little bit about me. Um, it's a little bit different. I just thought I wanted to do two truths and one lie today. So I wanted you to try to pick out which one might be a lie. I was in a TV series. I got a perfect score on the math portion of the ACT, and I have dined and dashed. Um, below, here is my family. That's my husband and my two sons. I have a 10-year-old and a 20-year-old. Here's a picture of me with my friends. I love to travel with them during the summer and take trips. And then I also am involved in my church. I teach, teach the children at my church. So that's a little bit about me and we'll go with uh, which one is a lie at the end of the presentation. So you can be thinking about that um, as we're going through. This is our KCM website. There's a plethora of information here, um, activities for teachers, resources for professional learning, um, and so all of these virtual resources are on there as well. Those sessions are recorded. So you can go there and click and find a session that you want and join in. Today's agenda, we're gonna focus on some place value standards. We're gonna look at Kathy Fosno's landscape of learning. We're gonna think about unitizing, assessing place value understanding and addressing misconceptions and then activities to support uh, those misconceptions and understandings. These are the look at the Kentucky standards. Um, I highlighted the kindergarten standard, which would um, be what my presentation would be focused on today, composing and decomposing numbers from 11 to 19 using quantities. And then as you can see, all the other standards that are related to place value, and I just listed those three second grade. Um, there's obviously more than that, but I just, um, I just ran out of room. We're gonna focus on um, looking at Kathy Fosno's landscape of learning from her context for learning mathematics. And I chose this because this what needs to be in place um, to develop the conceptual place value. They need opportunities and experiences to develop these skills and strategies. And we're gonna look a little bit further into this. What we mean by landscape of learning as a teacher is for teachers to open up their teaching. They need to have a deep understanding of what this landscape is, of what it looks like and the strategies and the skills and the big ideas and the models for children to construct these strategies. And these are landmarks they pass as they journey toward numeracy. And we're gonna look a little more deeply at this today through the lens of what kids need to know for the basis of place value understanding. This one, I've just um, cut it in half and made it larger so that you could see. Um, so these are the, the skills for number sense, addition and subtraction. And so thinking about um, what, what kids need, and I'm gonna go back. I just want you to pause for a moment and think about what do you notice? So this horizon shows landmark strategies, which are the rectangles. And then the big ideas are the ovals. And then the models are gonna be the triangles, the models that children are gonna use. And the purpose of this graphic is to, for you to see the longer journey for mathematical development and for you to think about your work or your rich tasks as a teacher that you're gonna provide for these students within these units of a scope of long-term development. You could also use this graphic as a way to record student progress of individual learning. And that way you can um, shade in each landmark as you find evidence in a child's work or what a child says. And I really wanna highlight that because as a teacher, we don't have true understanding of just what a child might write down on a piece of paper. We need to know their ideas and thinking behind um, why they wrote that answer. So that, that is evident that we want the teacher to be involved in the child's learning and really asking them questions and focusing in on and conferring with them as to what's going on. So in a sense, you'll be recording these individual pathways of your, that children take into um, developing being a young mathematician. And what I wanted to, this is the top half. So I really wanted you to focus in on thinking about the ideas of place value. Thinking about looking here, place value, determine, place of the numbers determine value. Unitizing is very important, combinations of 10. And then up at the top, we have equivalence with place value. So I want you to think about all that needs to go in into place before actually place value um, is developed. So I want you to think about some rich tasks 
and not just word problems, but real tasks, true problematic situations that are going to support and enhance this investigation and inquiry um, that children are going to go through. So I want you to think about real opportunities for kids to make these mathematical connections and structures in their real world that are going to make sense to them. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Lawson's um, numer continuum of numeracy development. And so what we see there, it's a lot of mathematical knowledge that supports this conceptual understanding of place value. And place value develops as students interact with these strategies that develop as they experience these key ideas. And the strategies that kids use are important as we teach the big ideas. So kids only come through these rich mathematical experiences and we're going to look at these um, during this presentation. I just wanted to point this out that it's more of a linear model of what kids need to know. So how they start out the key ideas of how one to one correspondence, cardinality, part whole relationships and this hierarchical inclusion and then equivalence and then unitizing and then place value. So there are a lot of key ideas and strategies that need to be, be developed before they can be proficient in thinking about um, what place value actually means. And so we want to look at this today. Um, this is what's missing. And this is a teacher who attended one of our trainings and we were talking about place value and we were talking about the concept of if kids truly understood a numerical composite number. And so she truly thought that her kids did. And so she thought that she's going to ask them this question in, in sort of a number talk form. And she asked them, poses the question, is 14 a part of 20? So she's trying to assess their understanding. I want you to think about this problem right here. Is 14 part of 20? Is 14 part of 20? I see some of you already giving me a thinking thumbs up. That's great. You're not interrupting anybody's thinking. Just gonna tell me your answer if I call on you. Gregory, come on down when you're done. What do you think, Jack? No. Okay. Jack Lee says no. You agree with Jack? Give him a me too. I see some people saying, I'm not so sure. I think I have a different answer. That's okay. We're gonna work it out and talk it out. Daniel, what do you yes. think? Okay, Daniel says yes. Lots of VTs. Madeline, what do you think? No. Uh oh. Marla says no. Laura, what do you think? Yes. chance to share with your talking partner in a little bit, okay, if I didn't call on you to share up here. So put your hands down, and let's go back to Jack. Jack, you said no. Why'd you say no? Why do you think 14 is not part of 20? Prove that for me. Yeah, because it's a number, okay? So there's a one in the front. That's called the what place? <coughs> the tens place. And the four in the ones place. He said the four in the back. Okay, so it can't be part of it because that has a different number in the front. Is that what you're saying? In the ones or in the tens place? Okay. So it has different numbers. In the tens place. Okay. Daniel. 
tell me your thinking. You said yes. Last time I was on the ocean with Laura, and then she and she said if you add the water to the Go to ten. No, that's what I said. Add numbers to make it go to the right number. Yeah, Xander, I think that was Xander. Yeah, she so said it was. So, what crazy. can you add? So, you said you you revert. Yeah. We had this discussion once before. Can you help explain your thinking? Because the four oh, is in the ones place and the zero is in the ones place, and they both have different numbers because four and zero are not the same number. Okay, and so Jack was looking at the tens place, and you're saying because it doesn't match in the ones place, it's not part of it. No, right? and the one is in the tens place, and the two is in the tens place, and they're not the same number. Okay, so they're not the same. Because the, the place value, that's called place value when you look at the one, uh, tens in one's place. So not the same place value is what I'm going to say there. Uh, Does anybody agree with Natalie? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Um, so my thought to you is, I want you to think about this teacher was thinking about her kids and was thinking about what she thought they knew about place value. And so she asked them this question and, and she was really surprised that the very first kid said that they 14 was not a part of 20 because the one was in the front and the four was in the back. And then the 20, there's a two in the front and he even said an O in the back. And I want you to think about how kids are still trying to think about these representations of number and thinking about that little mishap of calling the O and the zero, but still, it just gives them, gives us some thought to where they are into thinking about symbolically, um, when we think about the three aspects of number and thinking about place value, the misconceptions or the things that kids are still trying to figure out. Um, one kid answered correctly and said, if you add the numbers to make it go to the right number, so they're assessing their prior knowledge of another um, conversation that they've had, relating to you can add two numbers to get another number. So they're thinking that if you add 14 and six, you're gonna get 20. And so that, that's, that's some good thinking. And, but then the other little girl at the end, um, when I fast forward there, she said no, that it wasn't. And again, she wasn't looking at the tens place. She said, well, let's just look at the ones place and the numbers there are not the same. So therefore 14 cannot be a part of 20. And so when we're thinking about kids having these misconceptions about this numerical composite, and I want you to think about what can we do to make sure that they have a solid understanding. So we're going to look at some activities, um, thinking about what you can do to support this understanding. So Kathy Fosno says that these are the big ideas that are needed to support the understanding of the foundations of place value. So when we think about place value at 10, we have to make sure that cardinality, one-to-one -one correspondence, hierarchical inclusion, and compensation and equivalence, and then this idea of unitizing. And so unitizing is um, what we're gonna focus on today, because I feel like most teachers um, think about cardinality and one-to-one -one correspondence, and so they have a lot of activities there. So we're gonna focus on some activities to support the development of, of unitizing and what that seems like. And then here are some strategies that she uses uh, to support this foundation of place value. One of the most important things that um, she focuses on is this idea, and she calls it context for learning mathematics. And so we're gonna listen to her to see what she thinks about how contexts are so important. Several reasons to set mathematics in a context. One is simply because if there is a real context and children are mathematizing their own lived worlds, they have a hook 
they have a way in. They don't get lost in an abstraction. They can fall back on the real context. They may not even know how to start the problem, but they can start with a picture of the context. They find a way to model the problem, and then they begin to have insights of how they might go about solving it. They don't get lost in an abstraction and then think, what should I do here? Is this, do I multiply, divide, or add? It's about modeling the problem. So context is critical to help children realize what they are doing. But there's a second reason that's very, very important. And that is that when you design investigations for children to work on, you can actually, the designer can actually employ the use of context didactically. You craft it. You choose the numbers carefully. You want to make certain strategies begin to emerge. Let's say I want to make partial products emerge. And I line up, I get a picture of a bunch of um, six packs of water. And they're stacked. And the only thing the child sees when he looks at the picture is the six bottles at the top. He can't see, he knows there's more packs, but he can't count the bottles because he can't see them. I've crafted that context to push him from counting all to skip counting or to use repeated addition. If I want to push partial products, I change the way I've stacked the water bottles the packs, and I put some packs in front of others. Maybe I have, for example, four rows of five in each. And then behind it, I have um, four rows, five in each. Now I've pushed doubling the two partial products. Now, suppose I change the one in the back, and I, where I have four fives, and I add five fives, and those are visible. So now there's nine in the back, but the four by five can't be counted. I've pushed partial products. There's all different ways to craft the context progressively as you build sequences of investigations where the child just feels like he's working on problems from his own lived world. And he's just doing math workshop like they do every day. But the Investigations have been didactically crafted using context to consciously ensure progressive development. So I want you to think about how context is so important here and how when we're thinking about the kids being involved in the mathematical practices, the very first one is um, persevere and problem solving. And so thinking about with the context, it makes the kids have an entry point, which is critical because we know if they don't do the first mathematical practice, then none of the other mathematical practices are going to happen because they have to persevere through the problem. And so using this context of kids that kids know and building upon that. Now, we're not going to be talking about partial products today as an example, but we are going to look at what is it? What is the 10 frame look like? If we're thinking about that, the unitizing of five, so we're going to look at what it might look Think about a bunk bed, so to speak. So we're gonna get, put it in context of a bunk bed. So thinking about what might a 10 frame look like. There's five on the top and five on the bottom. And then moving towards this progression of a double-decker bus. So thinking about what would a bead rack look like and introducing that. But the point is here is I want you to think about is these carefully crafted investigations and thinking about these contexts and how we're gonna progressively introduce these to kids that are gonna support these strategies for um, place value understanding. And so we're gonna look a little more into that. And what we're gonna focus on is these resources to support this conceptual understanding. And Kathy Fosno has developed these um, units, so to speak, and each, um, each book is a unit. And so there'll be um, two weeks or, or 10 days of, of topics that you can look at with your kids. And so the main focus of, of, of how she sets it up is that the kids are going to be, of course, it's going to be in a context that they're going to understand, and then they're going to have an investigation that they're going to work through, usually in partners, and so that you can have many strategies and ideas come out. And then as a teacher, you're going to walk around and be conferring with the students as they're working. So you're going to be writing down what you noticed and what they say, and you're going to be looking at their strategies. And in the context of you're going to think about at the end of this, you're going to have a mathematical congress, and that's where you're going to have some bring the kids back together, and you are going to sequence how they're going to present their strategies or how they figured it out. 
And the way that you present that is going to hopefully help them bring out some more understanding. And so that's the focus of it. And these come, it starts out with bunk beds and apple boxes. And then there's a book called Organizing and Collecting. And then it goes to the double decker bus. And there's some other ones in there and it goes to the t-shirt factory. I'm going to be the one, I'm going to be going over the ones that specifically kind of focus, focus on unitizing today. And um, I want you to think also about if you don't have these books at your school, you may have them. We use them in um, the comprehensive courses a couple of years ago. So that might be something to think about if you could ask an intermediate plus two teacher, um, possibly if they have the book. And a lot of them you can just Google. Um, they're um, in PDF form and they're, the stories that they use um, are also, a lot of them are on YouTube. So you can just um, Google them and then, and then you can pull them right up. So you'll know what I'm talking about. You don't necessarily um, need to purchase the whole set. But I will say that there's more books than just this three. There's, there's eight or nine books that come with posters. And I think this set is about $215. So it might be something that you want to invest in because it does reach kindergarten through possibly third grade students. So that might be something that you may want to invest in. Another thing I love about these series is that, that it integrates mathematics and reasoning. And I think any time that you can integrate those, oh, I'm sorry, I said mathematics and reasoning, I meant mathematical reasoning and literacy. So thinking about those two, and it just makes sense to kids. So this unit that we're going to talk about, it starts out with a book that's called The Sleepover. And this is about a little girl, Sarah, and she loves to play tricks on her Aunt Kate. And her Aunt Kate has um, given her permission that she can have seven friends over. So they're going to have a sleepover of eight kids and they're going to sleep on the, they're playing around on the bunk bed. And so Aunt Kate begins to bring them snacks. And when she brings them snacks, there's four on the top and four on the bottom originally. But when she goes downstairs, they've changed their configuration. So it's sort of a series of what happens in these part whole relationships. And I wanted to show you this, thinking about this virtual learning that we're doing right now. Um, if you wanted to play or read the sleepover story to your kids, and then you could give them, um, or they could come up with their own configuration of how their friends um, might be on the bunk bed. And then as you can see, this is a picture of them compiled into a story. And so that might be something that you could compile um, in a Google Docs or something like that, that they could send to you um, their version of how they compiled it. And then you could read it to them um, as a story after you compiled them. So thinking about this foundation of unitizing on the bunk bed leads us to think about what are, how many ways can we trick Aunt Kate? So think about this, this thought about aspect of unitizing is often overlooked in early place value instruction. And um, it's one of the developmental big ideas, the foundations of it. So we want to make sure that this introduction of um, the sleepover introduces the bead rack. And so it highlights the big ideas of compensation and equivalence. And um, unitizing, why we want to focus on it, it's, a, it's the child's ability to see numbers and groups. And it's an ability that they use and um, that they're going to see simultaneously like a chair. One chair is going to have four legs. And then they may count by twos to support that understanding. Um, or to hold one number in their head when counting on or begin to think about grouping numbers into tens. Grouping numbers into tens is this um, especially significant because a set of 10 is going to play a major role in children's initial understanding of the numbers between 10 and 20. And when a child sees a set of six with a set of 10, they should know without counting that the total is 16. However, the numbers between 10 and 20 are not an appropriate place to discuss really these place value concepts. Um, so that is prior to a much more complete development of place value concepts. They're more appropriate for second grade and beyond, but children should not be asked to explain the one in the 16 as representing one 10, because the concept of a single 10 is just too strange for a kindergarten or an early first grader child to grasp. And some would might even argue that it's not appropriate for first grade at all. Um, but the appropriate, the inappropriateness of discussing one 10 and six ones, they think about what's a one. What does it mean that a set of 10 should not figure prominently in discussion of teen numbers? Um, but unitizing requires that children not only use the numbers to count not only objects, but also the groups of objects and to count them both simultaneously. 
And for young learners, this unitizing is a very strong shift in their perspective than what they've had before. They've learned to count objects, but they've learned to count them one by one. So unitizing these 10 objects as one thing or one group challenges their original idea of number. So how can something be 10 and one at the same time? So thinking about some of plays value can become very procedural when it's approached approach solely as positional. So we wanna think about how confusing this is for kids. And they believe one to be one no matter where it is. And we wanna think about just as if their dad was in another room, they might be in another room, the kitchen, the garage or outside, he's still their dad. He doesn't change thinking about no matter where he may be in the home or outside the home. So um, this is complex thinking for kids. And so we wanna think about as children develop the ability to see five as a subunit, then they begin to see and count them in groups of five. For example, they may say that 15 is three groups of five. Here they are unitizing this group of five and they begin to, to count as such. And so we're gonna look at um, the foundations for unitizing. And so the bunk bed problem is a way to think about um, what are all the ways that we can make eight? And in the resources that I've, um, these, these um, copies are there for you. So you can copy the bunk bed problem in this bunk bed map. If you wanna give kids some problems about working out how many kids are on the bed with, with manipulatives and how many might be on the top. And this is how many we may record all the ways that we may trick Aunt Kate, um, thinking about how many kids are on the top of the bed and how many kids are on the bottom of the bed. So we wanna think about even more unitizing activities. So moving on from, from the bunk bed, so we're thinking about this unitizing, how many on the top and how many on the bottom, this part, part, whole relationship. We wanna think about um, this early number sense as children explore various arrangements of the same quantity, um, just as they are in the, in the bunk bed. In the apple boxes unit, um, it's gonna think about a grocer arranges two different kinds of apples in various ways. So we've got red apples and green apples, and this is the unit that's gonna introduce, again, the bead rack and what it looks like. Um, it's gonna help children be able to think about, to automatize maybe the basic facts through practice and real world um, concepts. Thinking about this grocery store and the apples. And, and everybody's been to a grocery store and we've seen apples. So that's something in context that, that we can think about. Another game to think about a part, part, whole, this game is part, part, whole bingo, and it uses um, these unifix cubes. And a children, two children, they're gonna have different bingo cards, and they're gonna roll the dice and say the number they rolled here is five. So they're gonna choose how they fill up their bingo card. So I can either have five in one straight line, or I could have a group of three and a group of two, and I might lay those down on my board. Or I could do a group of two, a group of two, and a group of one, if those different combinations were on my board. So it really supports the strategy um, of, of not only strategy of how many, how I wanna break apart this quantity of, of five or whatever it is I roll to win the game, but it also supports these different combinations of hierarchical inclusion and in these different quantities that are embedded within these numbers. And so I don't want you to forget your role as a teacher. So we don't just give these games and activities and then go on with whatever we wanna do. We wanna be purposeful and really recording where our kids are. And the only way we can do that is through offering them these investigations and then following through with them and asking them questions and conferring with them as they're um, investigating these activities and then recording them. So I just wanted to put this here, as you can see, this is, this is even so, so important as can the kid model the story? Are they modeling the correct you know, operation that they're using? Um, are they counting with one-to-one -one correspondence? Do they know how many is at the end? Or do they have an unorganized pile? And that's something to think about too. So we wanna think about um, our role as a teacher, continue not only are we crafting these investigations, but we're also involved in, in the thinking about the investigation. That moves us to an, um, another activity or book and it's called the Double Decker Bus. So in the Double Decker Bus, um, there's a little girl and she's wanting to drive this Double Decker Bus and as it's going by every day, she's intrigued by it and she sees that how many people are on the top but how many people are on the bottom and also notices that the seats are in different colors. Some of them are red and some of them are white. And 
there's, um, this introduces students to the benefits of using the five structure to calculate quantities quickly. And it supports um, solving addition and subtraction problems. And it also supports this automatizing of basic addition and subtraction facts. Um, and it was designed to be used in first grade. And it develops a basic facts to 20 and works toward this um, thinking about the 20 bead rack and what it might look like. And so again, through this contextual um, manipulative here, so we're thinking about the context of a double decker bus, and then we're thinking about what it might look like on this um, double Tim frame. I'm sorry, this, this bead rack, not the Tim frame. Um, so this is designed that students can show um, partnerships with numbers. So here's an activity that you might use with it. So the double decker bus, it's divided into easy and hard arrangements. So if 10 people were on the bus, what might be an easy way? Well, we might put five on the top and five on the bottom. The hard way might be if I have to think about if six people are on the top and then figure out how many people are on the bottom. And so we might change that to different numbers. We'll have 14. How might you think about that? How might you think about 16 people on the bus? What would be the easy way? And what would be the hard way? So thinking about um, kids are going to look at the structure of the bead rack and then thinking about what this bus looks like. This activity on the bottom is a picture of, again, we're supporting it with the contextual of this is what the bus looks like, but we have the beads here. And the students are going to work in partners to show the same numbers, um, of same number of passengers on the bus, and we can find pairs, and that gives um, first graders the opportunity to explore these equivalent equations and what they look like. So again, um, the double-decker bus, you can, you can Google that, and you can, you can pull it up usually on YouTube. Somebody's reading it. And um, also, I wanted to point out, if you're going to do this virtually, you can think about pulling up the YouTube video and turning off the sound if you want it your voice and then just, just talk over the video. So that might be a way um, to support your students at home as well. All right, so we're going to move on to some larger numbers. And so we're going to look at the Maslopy family. And the Maslopy family is kind of like myself. They're very unorganized um, with the stuff in their home. And so um, the little boy, I believe, if I remember correctly, his name is Nicholas, and he decides that he needs to organize the items in the home. And so he wants to show his family how many exact things, of exact number of each object that they have. And so um, this class decided that they wanted to find out how many items were in their manipulative area. So here you can see kids um, recording dominoes and counting them and, and grouping them. Here they're grouping some uh, flower magnets and here they're just grouping some centimeter unifix cubes. And so I want you to look at down here as, it, as the, the kids are working, these kids have um, grouped them by twos. And these have put them in groups of 10. And so when they organize their items, we want to ask them, what is the easiest way to count them? And how do you know that that's how many that you have and how are you for sure? And so we want to have the conversations of there's these dominoes are in groups of 10. So there's easy to see that there's 101 dominoes because I can see 10 sets of 10 and one left over. But when I group these flowers in groups of two, I may ask the, the question to the kids, was this the most efficient way? Which one had to do the most counting or the most calculations of, of how many objects were in that collection? So having those conversations with kids thinking about how we group items is important. I thought that you may be able to share this activity with students at home. So maybe you have them to choose an object at home and count um, how they're gonna group them. So how, ask them, how are you gonna organize these objects? Maybe they're gonna organize, um, I don't know, their Pokemon cards or their Nerf bullets or their Legos um, or how many LOL dolls they have. So these are ways that, and you're gonna ask them, how are they grouping them? And in the resources portion, portion of this, I do have accounting collections, um, little recording sheet that, that you could share with families and have them um, re write down how they're recording, how many objects that uh, they choose. And then you can, you can have some conversations about an efficient way to count those numbers. All right, now we're gonna move on to more contextual unitizing in Grandma Eudora's T-shirt factory. And so thinking about this unit begins with the story of Grandma Eudora's T-shirt factory. <coughs> Again, this storybook um, is online. And so Grandma's part of the Misloppy family 
and you know they're sloppy and everyone's forever losing and misplacing things and looking for things and um one day um he organizes some t-shirts uncle would organize some t-shirts with rubber bands and then itchy the family dog he knocks over a bottle of bleach and the result is of this mishap is some colorful tie-dye t-shirts which grandma begins to sell in a highly successful business so the idea of the t-shirt factory is brought to the kids in the classroom as a simulation of what might happen and then children are going to work in groups as companies with factories and they're making and selling the t-shirts and organizing them in the warehouse so the main focus of this unit is place value regrouping equivalence and recording the inventory and the students are going to keep track of the before and after so thinking about real world students are going to be excited by this playing the role of employees and keeping account of the inventory all while and you can see some posters that they've made um, to think about how this development of this contextual unitizing comes about and if you look here everybody has some old t-shirts so this is some old t-shirts in the classroom and so they're putting them in groups and rolling them up and then seeing how many they have left over and being able to record that so I want you to think about, I know my presentation at the beginning was thinking about um, just place value to 10, but I want you to think about the important big ideas and skills that need to be developed before we get to um, second or third grade, before this contextual unitizing takes place. And I want you to stay focused on keeping it in context and keeping it real and the students interested. So we're gonna move to thinking about how do we assess student understanding? And so when you Google a place value assessment, pictures like this are what comes up and it's often what you might see sometimes, but by the end of first grade, students are expected to understand um, that two digits of a two digit number represents amounts of tens and ones. And in second grade, then they're gonna extend their understanding to three digit numbers and the meaning of these digits in hundreds, tens and ones. But first and second graders are generally familiar with numbers up to 100 and many can write them from one to 100. Many can compare the numbers, let's say 54 and 45, and they can tell which is greater. And many can identify in which digit the two digit numbers is in the tens place and the ones place. And these used to be the assessment I relied on for checking students' understanding of place value. Typically using worksheet assessments on which students filled in the missing numbers and they circled the greater number and indicated which digits, you know, were in the tens and ones place. But once I began to spend time asking students questions face to face, I found out that while worksheet assessments might be helpful, interviews often produce surprising and sometimes disturbing evidence of this shaky understanding of, of place value. So, um, for example, sometimes when asked to write the number 38, maybe they were stumbling when they reached 29 and they're not sure what comes next. I see that a lot. Or when students were asked, you know, to make the number 38, they would write 308. So a 30 and then an eight, like 308. Um, they write it just as it said, or they might write, when we get past 100, they write 101 and they might write 1001. And so they're really confused and thinking about um, how, even though they might know 54 and 45 and comparing them, for example, and they might offer the explanation that 54 is greater because it comes after 45, rather than thinking about explanations that didn't relate to the place value of digits. So that was something that I would see a lot in my classroom. And then these, these were some, some assessments that you might often see. And really these assessments, um, they're very positional and they can also, Kids pick up very quickly, like these rods and ones, they can just count the rods and they'll put it in there. They'll say how many rods. Oh, there's six, there's six rods there and they'll write the six and however many ones, if there's nine ones, they'll write the, one, the nine there. And they have no idea that this six rods represents actually the quantity of 60. So as teachers, we need to be very intentional in thinking about having these conversations with, with our kids. And so I'm just gonna show a couple of these, thinking about having the student interview, really a face-to-face, -face, asking them questions related to um, thinking about the quantity behind the place value. So I'm gonna show you um, this guy first. Can you write the number 16 here? Kind of big. I'm gonna tell you write 16. And if I show you here, let's see, one, two, three, four. This is what the six means. It means 
I could show the six with six cubes. Can you show me with the cubes what the one in the 16 means? Um, one? But these are the ones I took out and I said, this, these six match the number six. Can you show me from the cubes what, what matches the number one? the number 16 here kind of big cubes can you show me with the cubes what the one in the 16 means um one but these are the ones i took out and i said this these six match the number six can you show me from the cubes what what matches the number one So as you can see there, and I forgot to tell you at the beginning, these, these are second graders here. So let me show you this little girl. Can you write the number 16 kind of big here? Yep, that's 16. And I'm gonna show you with the cubes what the six means. Here are one, two, three, six cubes. Can you show me with the cubes what the one in the 16 means? Right. Can you show me, I showed you with the cubes what the six means in the number 16. Can you show me with the cubes what the one means in the number 16? It means 10. All right, so right away, um, she realized that it meant 10. And so I just want you to focus on and think about this place value interview and how really asking kids to produce the quantity and thinking about what they mean, what the quantities mean in relation to um, the two digit numbers. We'll give you some information as a teacher. On our website, we also have some fluency assessments, um, especially the fluency assessment to 20 has questions um, like this to make sure that you ask kids to um, make sure that they understand this uh, concept of place value and what goes into that. So make sure that you might wanna look at that on our site as well. And this came from Marilyn Burns' blog as, as you probably recognize her. So um, thinking about these are interviews that she tried and tested. So when you think about, um, would your kids understand this comic here? So he'd be nothing without her. The zero would be nothing without the one. And so basically if they can explain this to you, I think that they can explain um, place value. And so I wanna just leave you with, with thinking today that I, wanna, I want you to focus on creating rich contextual tasks for your kids. I know a lot of times our curriculums might be set up. We just want to do a skill set, a skill set, a skill set, one right after the other with this concept of, of making it connect, not only connect to the real world, but connect to these representations that we're using. And so using these resources um, from Kathy Fosno can really bring out this progression of these big ideas and skills in this landscape of learning. And you can see where your kids are. And so you can begin to see if they have gaps, you can start to fill those in rather quickly with, the, with these activities. Again, you can Google the resources. They're probably resources that you already have at your school. We also have some, if you're really interested, we have some at the KCM that you could check out perhaps, and you can check the whole kit out and use it at your school and try it out and see if it was something that you may like. Um, so here's some upcoming virtual professional learning opportunities for you. Um, we'll be hosting them all week. If you can attend live, then we'll, we'll record the session um, so you can review them later. We'd love to have you. Also, I wanted you to think about visiting our website again. You can just go right there. And these are the virtual mini series that we're offering for virtual PD. These are hyperlinks, so you can click on them and it will take you to the recorded session that if you've missed one. Again, um, my name is Julie Adams. I've been pleased to spend a little bit of time with you this afternoon. If you'd like to contact me at any time and just and talk or you need some resources, I'd be happy to help you. There's my email address there. And I like to end with the two truths and one lie. The lie is I did not get a perfect score on the math portion of the ACT. And so I know you're probably thinking about the other truths and um, I, I can go them in, in deep explanation later, but I just want you to see that you don't have to get a perfect score on the ACT to be good at math and to have a growth mindset about math and to realize that we're all learning every day. So thank you for joining us this afternoon and we'll be um, pleased to meet up with you next time.